Today, we're interviewing Yuvraj Mohan, a quantum engineer at Vergetti Computing and an um alumni of Homedale High School, which is where I'm going right now for high school. So it's a pleasure to be interviewing you today. My name is Therese Jasti. I'm a rising junior at Homedale High School and the founder of Company Roots. My name is Raul Kabur. I'm a rising freshman at St. Paul School and the vice president of Company Roots. Before the interview, we just want to thank you so much for taking your time. Thank you. The first question that we always ask is, what were your Company Roots and how did they help you get into Vergetti Computing? Uh, what, what was the question? What was the first part of that? Sorry. What were your company roots and how did they help you get into Rigetti Computing? Uh, okay. Um, so I would say, so just a little bit of like my background. So I graduated a Homedale High School in 2010 um, and I went to undergrad at University of Pennsylvania um, mm -hmm. in Philadelphia. And in my undergrad, I studied uh, material science and engineering and also physics. Mm -hmm. And then I also did my grad school, my master's also at University of Pennsylvania and I did that in nanotechnology. Right. And during my master's in nanotechnology, I knew that um, I wanted to build devices or build technology that leveraged uh, like the cutting edge of physics, like whatever the new the frontiers of physics were that people are researching, how could we take that scientific knowledge and um, engineer it to make useful uh, devices? Yeah. Um, so one of the, you know, there's many, there's many things uh, that like leverage quantum physics. Um, but one of the most interesting was interesting things was like quantum computing and yeah. being able to uh, solve computational problems, uh, like which we'll probably get into more later, some examples of those. Um, but being able to do those, solve such problems um, and building devices to do those kind of things was like really interesting to me. So I knew I wanted to do that. Um, and uh, Brigetti was like, you know, an up and coming player in, in this uh, so far still new field. Yeah. So, so I decided to, yeah, come here. <laughs> yeah. Um, so Brigetti Computing was listed by MIT as the top 30 smartest companies in the world. And that's, I mean, if MIT could list me as the smartest person in the world, then I probably would be amazed. I would be. <laughs> um, so what does Brigetti Computing do that makes it uh, so big? And how are you changing the world? Right. So, uh, so far, um, most of the major companies uh, that are working on quantum computing, uh, you know, like Intel, Microsoft, IBM, uh, and Rigetti, um, what differentiates us from everybody else is their main focus, like they are not a quantum computing company. They are, you know, for in, in, the, for ex in the Google's example, they are um, a search engine or an advertising company yeah. that also is working on quantum computing. You know, they're also working on, you know, self-driving cars and many other things. Yeah. Um, same thing with Microsoft, right? They are not a quantum computing company and neither is IBM. They might be working on quantum computing, but that is not their main focus. Right. right? And what, what sets us apart is like we, the purpose of the company is to make a quantum computer. So we're like, you know, very uh, focused on that particular mission and, and another thing that kind of sets us apart is we build um, everything. And I mentioned in some of our email correspondence that we're like a full stack quantum computing company. Yeah. Uh, what that means is like, so for example, in regular computers, um, Apple, you know, they might design their chips that go into the iPhone and they send these designs to chip makers in, you know, Taiwan or China or, you know, or Intel make, make them. Mm -hmm. And then they get these chips and they get, you know, the screen from somewhere and the phone casing from somewhere else and the chips from somewhere else. And they put it all together and they sell you an iPhone. Yeah. So they're not, they're, they're not really the, a full stack company. They're not like building the hardware and developing the apps that are going to run on that hardware. They're not, they're not doing it all in house. Yeah. We build the chips in house. We assemble the entire system, which, you know, the, it's not just the chip. There's a lots of control electronics and, and a big thing called the dilution refrigerator because you have to cool the chip down to, yeah. to, to 10 millikelvin to operate it. And like setting up all these things together and then writing custom software to, to operate it all, um, it's, it's a lot easier done if you do everything in-house. Um, so that's one of the big things that sets us apart. Yeah. So what is the um, chip exactly made of? Like what does it, what, um, what is it composed of? So, so we work, uh, the, our quantum chips are, the type of qubit we work with, the type of quantum bit, is uh, called a superconducting qubit. Uh, mm -hmm. So it's made with superconducting materials. Um, Google's chips and IBM's chips um, are also made of uh, similar materials. So they leverage typical like Silicon uh, Valley CMOS. CMOS is a, a compound metal oxide semiconductor. So like what regular chips are made out of, like silicon and you know other metals and stuff. Um, all this 
infrastructure to make these kind of chips is already present in California, hence the name yeah. Silicon Valley, right? <laughs> so, uh, so that's why this, this sort of qubit architecture has become like kind of the, the, the near term uh, leader uh, because you can leverage, you don't have to develop new fabrication facilities from scratch or, you know, do lots of basic research to, to develop these kind of qubits. Yeah. Uh, so they're, they're made of silicon um, and then there's many materials that you can use to, to make the superconductors out of. Uh, things like aluminum, for example. Um, so yeah, that, that's pretty much what it's made of. And then when we, the real magic happens when you cool it down um, and then these quantum effects really become uh, apparent when the chip is cold uh, because you're kind of isolating it from, from external noise sources like heat and you know, magnetic fields and things like that. Yeah, um, I have a question about your coolers. So when you're cooling the, I'm, I'm assuming quantum chips are like this small or something? Uh, they range in size everywhere from, you know, five millimeters to an inch, inch and a half. It depends, uh, well, you know, what kind of chip it is. Yeah. But yeah, they're, they're palm sized about. Yeah. And then are, are the coolers for those chips about like, I mean, one of my friends I was on a Skype call yesterday and I told him we're interviewing um, a person from this co uh, company who's, who's making quantum chips. And he's just like, that sounds impractical. And then I, I, I asked why, because I had, I had no idea about it. And so he said the reason was because you would, in order to cool something that could do so much, you would need a cooler the size of my bedroom. And the bedroom uh, would be big, so. So it, it's not quite the size of a bedroom, but it is pretty big. So, so um, the, uh, the coolers that we call, they were, they're called dilution refrigerators. And they're mm -hmm. essentially just refrigerators that work by um, a dilution of, of liquid helium. So essentially yeah. you, you, you cycle liquid helium through it and the liquid helium condenses and like sucks up heat from the chamber. So the entire chamber is kind of like these, uh, it's a series of, of cylindrical cans. And it kind of looks like, uh, like, a, like an upside down garbage can. <laughs> yeah. um, it's about the size, I'm looking over like my own fridge. It, it's yeah. about the size of like a, a regular refrigerator in your kitchen. Uh, mm -hmm. Maybe a little bit smaller than that. Yeah. Uh, so that's like one part of it. Then you also have another thing called the rack. And the rack contains all of the control electronics, um, all the things that deliver, you know, microwave pulses. So we control our computers with microwave pulses. Yeah. So there are these microwave pulse generators. Uh, there are um, electronics boxes that can generate magnetic fields. So we can control some of the qubits in different ways. So we have all of these electronics in this separate thing called the rack. And the rack is also about the size of a refrigerator. Yeah. So an entire quantum system, a quantum computing system like that you could, you know, access over the cloud and program, it's the, about the size of two refrigerators put side by side. Okay. Um, but one thing I do want to point out is quantum computers are probably at the stage that regular computers were at in like the 60s and 70s. Right. So we think back to like when the first regular computers were made, they were like, you know, vacuum tube things that filled up, you know, entire rooms. Um, quantum computers are still sort of at that, you know, nascent stage when they're, they're still, we're still developing the technologies to scale them up or make, and make them smaller and things like that. And yeah. just following up on that, um, how, do you, how do you predict it will, it will go as time passes by for the size? Do you think it will just get a little bit smaller or will it be like the max that I'm recording on right now where I can hold it with my hand? So, uh, so there are, I guess there, there are two sort of points to that. So one thing you have to worry about as you increase the, the chip size, right? Or the amount of qubits that you have on a chip, mm -hmm. um, for each qubit, you have to be able to send signals down into the fridge to control it, right? Yeah. Which means you have to have some sort of cables or wires that are carrying that signal, which means, and all those things are gonna be inside the fridge, which means you have more stuff to cool down. Yeah. So what, what this, what this, uh, what this called is a thermal load, right? And there's a maximum amount of thermal load that, that a fridge can handle, right? That it can cool down. Um, so balancing this thermal load is, is a problem that, uh, you know, everyone in this sort of super connecting uh, qubit community is dealing with and we're finding clever ways and tricks to uh, decrease the thermal load. Yeah. Um, the other thing is um, the amount of qubits doesn't necessarily have to double for you to get a, a doubling in computing power. Uh, the way the like the math of quantum computing works is every additional qubit you add, it doubles your computing power. Yeah. For example, if you go from two to three qubits. Two to the end. Uh, yeah, it's two to the end. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, so, and, you know, adding one, two, three qubits, it's not that much thermal load as say, if you were going from, you know, like 200 to 400, right? Yeah. So, uh, so I would say the thermal load thing is, is probably a big consideration, but 
I for now there's still there's we still have some thermal budget to go. So yeah. chips will continue to get bigger, and you know it's not just us that are working on this problem. Universities and other companies are also working on ways to make this cryogenic system more robust. Yeah. So um, would you say that like that's what the company is focusing right now, making the the chip the chip size? Uh, no, I would say, I would say we're focusing on, on everything. So our product is, uh, is something called forest. Uh, forest mm -hmm. is like the, the platform, yeah. um, that anybody can, you can go to our website, you can sign up and get a, a developer key and forest is essentially the portal that, or the application that lets you access our quantum computer over the cloud. Uh, so people can submit jobs to it. You can write your own programs in Python. We have our custom, uh, library of in Python, so it's you know rel relatively easy for people to learn. It's not as difficult as something like C++ or, or yeah. something. Um, so yeah, Forest is our main product. So I guess everything that everything that we're building is in support of of Forest and its capabilities. Because yeah. in the end, you can build an amazing machine, but you have to be able to to use it to do something, right? So in comparison, you said you mentioned Python, so that would actually answer my next question. So um. You, you only need to know the basics of Python to get into using Forest and to develop uh, the whole application? Yeah, so, so it, um, understanding the fundamentals of Python is like, uh, I guess, the basic requirement just to be able to read what, what, the, what the PyQuil, that's the name of our, our, our Quill stands for Quantum Instruction Language. So mm -hmm. PyQuil is Python Quantum Instruction yeah. Language. Uh, so to read PyQuil code, you obviously would need to know like basics of Python. But you also need to know something, you know, in order to, to understand like the quantum mechanics of what's, what's being written in the program or in order to actually write quantum algorithms, you would need a background in like linear algebra, like matrices and vectors and stuff. Yeah. And also, um, it would help to know some quantum physics, but we are trying to make um, our platform as, as easily accessible as possible. That like if you have some problem that you know how to write in Python, you can just use our hardware to do it without having, you know, a deep physics knowledge. So um, what is, that's still a work in progress. So. What is the difference? So like, uh, just in comparison to Java, cause I took AP computer science this year in high mm -hmm. school. So, uh, we learned Java and we use something called J creator, but most people use Eclipse. So is Forest like the Eclipse to, uh, the code. So, so I don't, I don't know too much about like the software side. I work in the fabrication of, of the, of the chips, but mm -hmm. what I, from what I do know, Forest is like, um, uh, what's the best way to put it? Forest is sort of like the portal. Like if you were to go on your computer and open up like a terminal, right? Like SSH mm -hmm. or something like that. Um, Forest would be like, like Forest is the server that you would connect to. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, yeah. Forest is like the server that you would connect to our Forest server and then you would submit jobs through, through the cloud, through the Forest server and that would, you know, schedule it to our system. The system would run the jobs and give you your answer back, essentially. Yeah. So, but in Forest is like the entire... Um, umbrella of different software components that make all this happen. So Forest, yeah. Forest I would say, is our main product. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's like our application, our quantum application. Yeah. So yeah. Um, when the company like hires people, do they look for, what qualities do they look for? Um, do they look for like, that they know like linear algebra, as you said before? So it, it depends what uh, part of the company uh, you're, you're interested in working in. So if, if a candidate's applying, um, you know, it could be anything from, the, the physicists and the theorists who like work on the physics and the design of, uh, of our quantum chips uh, to the people in the fabrication team that are more like, you know, engineering and like material science and like, you know, deal with the actual metal on silicon and the tools to make those kind of things. Yeah. And you also have the experimental physicists that operate the, refri the dilution refrigerators and, you know, calibrate the control pulses and operate the qubits um, or operate the chip as a quantum chip. Then you also have, I guess, the, uh, the software folks who, who write our own in-house, you know, quantum operating systems and things like that. So there, I would say there are different requirements for each um, uh, department of the company, depending on the field. Yeah. Uh, but, bro but broadly speaking, you know, we do have several company values that, that we generally look for in all candidates. Things like, you know, grit is, is like a big one. It's like, you know, we're trying to do something that nobody has done before that may yeah. not even be possible at this time. Mm -hmm. and, and we're a startup that doesn't have, you know, unlimited resources. So ha having yeah. grit and like resourcefulness is, is, a big, is a big thing that we value. Uh, things like, you know, compassion and being able to work in like a high, in a team environment without like, you know, having breakdowns or, or stress and things yeah. like that. That's a, that's a thing we value too. So there, there's, you know, a lot of company values you look out for. But in terms of technical skill set, uh, it depends on the department and the role. 
Yeah. And for, uh, for your position, so what do you do on a day-to-day basis in your office? Uh, so I do spend a lot of the time in the, in the lab itself or the fab, as we call it, the fabrication facility. So in there, um, you know, there are tools that we use to make the quantum circuits, you know, the qubits and various parts, all the circuit elements. Um, so I kind of, uh, so I deal with like the fabrication on the wafers themselves, uh, some of the testing of the device. Um, so before it's cooled down, um, we can test the chips at room temperature to try to get a predictor of how they might perform. Mm-hmm. Uh, because on a wafer, we use uh, six inch wafers. So they're like, you know, circular silicon wafers with six inch diameter. But if yeah. it's only five millimeters, you can fit hundreds of them on a wafer, right? And each fridge only can cool down, you know, one, two, four chips. You're not going to cool down hundreds. Right. So, so at a, from at just at room temperature, we can probe uh, all the chips in the wafer and determine, you know, which ones might perform the best uh, at, at, at cryogenic temperatures and kind of making that connection uh, involves some knowledge of like the physics that's going that's going on on the chip. So I kind of deal with that that correlation uh, yeah. and that fabrication of that stuff. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So, in your opinion, what is the strongest aspect of quantum chips? <laughs> the strongest aspect, like in terms of uh, usefulness as a device. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So, generally speaking, the what sets quantum computers apart from regular computers is they're able to do math that regular computers just cannot do. Um, and this has to do with some like the peculiar properties of, of quantum mechanics, things like uh, superposition, like uh, a quantum bit can be in the states of zero and one at the same time while mm-hmm. it's computing, whereas a regular computer, a, a bit is always in zero or one while it's computing, right? Yeah. Uh, so this sort of this, this property called superposition um, allows a lot of interesting effects to happen when the, when the computer is actually doing the computation, you know, not, and then when you read it out, you get a result that, that depends on the statistics of this superposition. Yeah. You can also have a, a, um, a phenomenon known as, an, known as an entanglement in which quantum information is correlated across the chip and, uh, and it gives rise to, uh, to effects that cannot be explained um, or, or like demonstrated. It's yeah. like, um, I remember I, back in like seventh or eighth grade, I read A Brief History of Time by Stephen Hawking. Uh, yeah. That book, he, he, like he, I, I probably didn't understand it too much, but he said that like, if you take two electrons at different positions, then they can exchange information spontaneously between the two. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, that, that's one is one example of that too. Yeah. So you can have this sort of entanglement even at like macroscopic scales. Like you can yeah. you can see our quantum ships with your naked eye, right? And you can mm-hmm. see our circuit elements with your naked eye, or very easily under a regular optical microscope. Yeah. Um, you can you can even have these quantum effects that you described in an electron, which is you know a subatomic particle, but you can also have it for for you know shapes made of metal of superconducting metal that are just behaving as quantum objects. Yeah. Um, so I would say that's what, that's really the power of, of these quantum chips is, is it all boils down to superposition and entanglement, which uh, gives rise to math that regular computers cannot do. Yeah. So um, how accessible are your products for regular people like Sori, I? Uh, very accessible, actually. So if you were to just go to regetti.com and I, somewhere on the top right or something, there's a, there's a button for Forest. And you just type in your email and they'll probably ask you like, oh, you know, why are you interested in using this or something? Mm -hmm. And you'll get an API key. um, And there's, you know, there's a whole document on like installation instructions and things like that. Um, You'll just have to have like a terminal or if you have a Windows, you know, some sort of like Mm -hmm. uh, terminal which you can code in and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, And setting it up is pretty straightforward. You can get it all set up probably in 10, 15 minutes and then uh, start submitting uh, quantum algorithms. (laughs) Yeah. So what exactly are quantum algorithms and how would people go over, like, let's say you have no, no basis in coding and you kind of like, you just learn Python and you just kind of know the basics of syntax. So at that point, how would you be able to make a quantum algorithm or is it not targeted towards those types of people? So, so I guess, the, I guess I would divide quantum algorithms sort of, at least at this stage into, into two uh, categories. One is like, people are still figuring out what quantum algorithms there are. Yeah. Uh, so like for regular computing, like computer scientists have been working on algorithm development before regular computers, you know, even became powerful enough to run them. Yeah. And that is still true in quantum algorithms. Like there are theorists that are working on, you know, once we have a you know 100 200 300 qubit quantum computer 
what are we going to run on it, right? Like what's going to be useful to run on it? So quantum algorithm development is still like a very open field. Um, and, you know, every week, every two weeks, there's a paper that released like, oh, someone came up with a new quantum algorithm to, you know, demonstrate, solve this problem or something. Yeah. Um, so, but the second category is sort of like just uh, conducting simulations of quantum physics, right? Because that's essentially, it's a quantum algorithm in a sense, but really you're, you're, you're doing the most basic thing that a quantum computer can do, which is just to emulate another quantum system, right? Like, like an atom or, or a molecule or something like that. Yeah. So in, in our, uh, our forest, like introduction documents um, in the PyCo docs, we have, you know, like examples, things like modeling uh, hydrogen or modeling rotations of qubits and stuff like that. And essentially doing physics problems on the quantum computer, which, which in a sense is quantum algorithms, but you're not actually solving a real world problem. You're just, you're running quantum algorithms yeah. which are just physics problems, right? Yeah. So, mm -hmm. so that, that, that's, I would say the best way, like if you don't have, if you just know syntax and I really have a background, I'm just looking to get started. That's probably the best way to get started is to just understand uh, like what quantum computation is and like what it can do. And then, then that'll give you an idea of what sort of real world problems you can translate into into code to run on a quantum computer yeah and i just watched ant-man and the wasp and they went all quantum on me in that movie so I'm no pretty... spoilers I, I haven't seen it yet no spoilers yeah <laughs> I, i'm gonna see it myself so yeah okay. <laughs> um so i'm gonna transition into more of a like school life type of thing so mm -hmm. in in your life uh what do you think matters more academics and grades or networking experience in the real world uh i would say they both mattered um in my so I, I'm sort of an anomaly in the sense that like the, the, th the field that I went into when I was an undergrad, uh, this field like wasn't even a thing commercially. Yeah. It, was, uh, it was really just in the domain of you know, physics departments and universities and national laboratories and stuff like that. There weren't really companies um, with serious quantum computing efforts at the time. Yeah. Uh, so, so networking really wouldn't have gotten me all that far. Um, at the time, I really focused on just like learning deep physics and um, understanding like the engineering of like nanoscale stuff like you know at the nanoscale physics gets weird physics is not how you would uh, you know it's not it's not like billiard balls um, particles are waves waves are particles you know yeah, all, all awesome. sorts of exactly yeah so um, I would in my experience focusing on like the fundamental science and the knowledge really helped me um, at least now uh, but I could imagine in someone who's like, you know, going to work in Intel or is interested in something like sensors or that a technology that already is developed and is just about making improvements or making innovations in it. Um, for them, networking might uh, definitely play a bigger role. Um, that being said, it never hurts to have friends in high places. So, you know, knowing, knowing professors, knowing, uh, you know, researchers at companies and, uh, you know, in even in like government labs stuff like that 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 will never hurt and it, you'll never know when it might come in useful come in handy in the future so yeah um also when you were in the home del did you have any like a uh, role model to look up to to like get you to the stage <laughs> um it's a good question so i would say there were two actually um my ap chem teacher dr blaha i'm not hey, sure if she's yeah. still there Okay, yeah. awesome. She, yeah, tell her you've read said teachers. hi, or tell her UV said hi. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, she, I, I loved her. I had her for honors and AP Chem, and she was tough, but she really made me understand and appreciate uh, chemistry and being able to explain the world around you with, with equations, you know, whether they're chemical equations or math. Um, I just find that very interesting that, like, you can explain the universe in, in this language, which is yeah. math, right? Um, the, and the other person uh, who is no longer uh, a teacher at home, though, I think he retired the year I graduate, was my uh, AP U.S. history teacher. Um, and I just really enjoyed that because he, he kind of taught history through a lens of being very skeptical about everyone's decisions. You know, like yeah. you hear the saying, there are always three sides to history, like the, side, the you know, story of the winner, the story of the loser, and then the truth. So and he seemed to like teach history and always, you know, it was interesting that a, a history teacher would teach you to think with a scientific viewpoint, yeah. like being very skeptical about things and like only trusting the facts and just seeing like, okay, what really went on? Uh, so I would say those two people re and like their way of thinking, uh, I really looked up to and it helped shape my thought process going forward as well. Yeah. 
And I guess they're both similar in that sense, because for me, uh, I'm not taking AP Chem or anything, but I'm taking a class called Honors Advanced Research, which is oh, probably for cool. you at a, a club, I think, after school. Yep. So it's a class now, and like Dr. Bell has mentoring like everyone's projects and stuff. So oh, that's great. <laughs> And then for U.S. history, uh, my second favorite teacher is uh, Miss Doggerty. I think she replaced your old teacher, I guess. But yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, U.S. history program still going strong. Yeah. <laughs> so um, you went to the University of Pennsylvania for your undergrad and masters. So mm -hmm. what activities did you do in Homedale High School to get admitted to like such a top-notch college? Uh, so I guess like, let me think. At at the time, there were like the big three things was like grades slash SATs was kind of mm -hmm. like grouped into one thing and then like extracurricular activities or leadership stuff and then like which including a volunteer things like that mm -hmm. and then uh, sports was like a big another third big category yeah um, so obviously you know I tried to do my best in school and like you know took my AP classes and all yeah. that stuff um, I also played uh, golf for Humdell High School mm -hmm. um, and that was like a big part of junior year and senior year uh, I played golf I think sophomore year too. Mm -hmm. um, and then I was involved in things like Key Club and uh, I don't remember everything. It was, it was a long yeah. time ago now, but uh, there were several groups I was involved at in school too. Mm -hmm. um, but I would say the, the biggest thing is like in an application anywhere for a university or for a job or, or anything, um, you just usually need to make sure that like your passion shows through and the fact that like why you really want that, you know, yeah. th that, that should really show through. And I think just writing a letter or some, or, you know, what an essay, a paragraph, whatever it might be, writing it from the heart I, I found has been very useful. Just like, you know, write with your heart and write what you truly want. And I, that's, I found that's a good yeah. way to, to get what you want <laughs> <laughs> or, or increases your chances. So, yeah. So, um, we always end the interview off on the same question. Um, what specific strategies would you give to the next generation of entrepreneurs and leaders um, looking to succeed in high school and further pursue their passion? Oh, wow. Okay. There's, <laughs> does it have to be one thing? <laughs> uh, no, it doesn't have to be one thing. Okay. Okay. So I would say the very first thing is don't be afraid of math. It doesn't matter if, if the field, you, if, if you want to be a lawyer and the field you want to go into, like has nothing to do with quantitative stuff math is a language and just how you know like more and more people in the world are speaking spanish or hindi or chinese and it's becoming yeah. more and more useful to know those languages math is the same thing mm -hmm. um and just view math as a language and learn it the way how you would learn any other language um and it'll 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 take people a long way uh the second thing i would say is uh don't give up so this sounds cliche um but if you if you keep if you have a plan and you keep executing on it, even in the face of failure, you will eventually get where you want to go. Um, mm -hmm. uh, and like people get disheartened pretty often. Uh, you know, I, I myself have been in situations when like it was, you know, things were not going great. And I just like, just kept, just kept pushing, just don't give up. And that's, you know, many very successful entrepreneurs will have said the same thing. So, so never give up, no math and uh, <laughs> follow and follow what you really love. So like people say a lot about, you know, work-life balance. I would like to rephrase that as you should find work-life integration. Right. If you're truly working on something you love, it shouldn't be work. It should just be another part of your life, right? So finding this work-life integration and being, finding a way to do that rather than the old school work-life balance, um, I would say that's, that's a, a happier way to live life in my yeah. experience. <laughs>